on, everybody. Get up on your feet and sing some praise with us now. Come on. Your love is like radiant diamonds bursting inside us. We cannot contain. Your love will surely come find us like blazing wildfires. Sing in your name. Come on now, lift it up. Your love is like radiant diamonds bursting inside us. We cannot contain. Your love will surely come by. Us, like blazing wildfires, singing your name, God of mercy, sweet love of mine, I have surrendered to your design, may there Stretch across the sky These hallelujah Be multiplied Go back and sing that verse Your love is Like radiant diamonds Bursting inside us We cannot contain Your love will surely come find us like blazing wildfire, singing your name. God of mercy, sweet love of mine, I have surrendered. To your design Now may this offering Stretch across the sky These hallelujah Be multiplied across the sky these hallelujah be multiplied these hallelujah be multiplied
who are we that you would be mindful of us what do you see that's worth looking our way we are free in ways that we never should be sweet release from the grip of these chains like hinges straining from the weight my heart no longer can keep from singing and all that is within me cries for you alone be glorified Emmanuel God with us my heart sings brand new song my debt is paid these chains are gone Emmanuel God with us don't you know our hearts don't deserve your glory Still you show A love we cannot afford Like hinges straining from the weight My heart no longer can keep from singing And all that is within me cries for you Glorify Emmanuel, God with us. My heart sings a brand new song. The dead is paid, these chains are gone. Emmanuel, God with us. Such a tiny offering compared to Calvary, but nevertheless, we lay this at your feet. Such a tiny offering compared to Calvary. But nevertheless, we lay this at your feet. All that is within me cries for you alone. Be glorified. be seated if you'd like to.
Thank you all for coming out to the Fallsby Church of Christ this morning. We are the Refocus Church, and we're glad to have you here this morning. And we're hoping that you're looking for a place to fully refocus your life on Christ and that you find it here today. Uh, if you have a prayer request for us, there's some information on the screen that you can use to get that to us. And we can all join together in prayer for the things that concern you so that we're together in the Spirit before our Lord. And that's just an awesome gift that He gives us. So let's make the most of that. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Fathers, we come to you in prayer this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here in your house and sing praises to your name. And we thank you, God, for who you are, who you've been, and who you will be. We thank you for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. We pray, Lord, you'll be with us and help us to lean on you for everything that we need to show a Christ-like example to the world. Grant us the love, knowledge, strength, compassion, understanding, humility, courage, and patience that it takes to do so. Uh, be with the many who are sick and afflicted among us, Lord, and just we ask that you'll heal them in whatever way you see fit and be with each of us as we have the opportunity to help in that effort and be your hands and feet here. I pray that you'll be with the many who have lost loved ones and comfort them in their time of need, Lord, and be with each of us as we continue to work for you, Lord. Strengthen us for the work ahead. And help us never lose sight of the goal of being Christ-like and serving you and bringing others to your presence. I pray, Lord, that you'll watch over us now and help everything that happens in this setting here today to be pleasing in your sight. Keep us safe both physically and spiritually, Lord, and as we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Separated Until the veil was torn The moment that hope was born And guilt was part of once and for all Captivated But no longer bound by chain Left at a Sinner and the sacred resolve And all of creation Sing with me now Lift up your voice And lay your burden down All of creation Sing with me now Fill up the heavens Let his glory Time has faded Now we see him face to face Every doubt he raised Forever we will worship the King And all of creation Sing with me now Lift up your voice and lay your burden down All of creation, sing with me now Fill up the heaven, let His glory resound Oh, 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 we breathe is to sing of his glory and for all he has done praise the father praise the son and the spirit in one in all of creation sing with me now Lift up your voice and lay your burden down All of creation, sing with me now Fill up the heaven, let his glory resound Whoa, oh, 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 oh. The 
reason we breathe is to sing of his glory and for all he has done praise the father praise the son and the spirit in one and all of creation sing with me now lift up your voice and lay your burden down all of creation sing with me now fill up the heavens let his glory resound and all of creation sing with me now lift your voice and lay your burden down all of creation sing with me now fill up the heavens let his glory resound and for all he has done praise the father praise the son and the spirit in one Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind but now i see so clearly hallelujah grace like rain falls down on me hallelujah and all my stains are washed away the washed away twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed grace like rain falls down on me hallelujah and all my stains are washed away hallelujah grace like rain falls down on me And all my stains are washed away, they're washed away.
when we been there ten thousand years bright shining as the sun we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Hallelujah, grace like rain falls down on me. Hallelujah, and all my stains are washed away. grace like rain falls down on me hallelujah and all my stains are washed away they're washed away Taking this communion meditation from the uh, book of Luke, chapter 9, verses 12 to 17. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so they can. I think it's up there. Send the crowd away so that they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place. He replied, you give them something to eat. They answered, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless we go and buy food for all the crowd, about 5,000 men were there. But he said to, the, said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so, and everybody sat down. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to set before the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. A lot of the events around Jesus' ministry on earth was around eating, eating together. It was important for him to gather around a table for discipling and evangelizing. We see countless examples of Jesus eating with people through scripture, especially in Luke. For example, in Luke 5, he eats with the tax collectors and sinners. Luke 7, the home of a Pharisee where he is anointed by a woman. Then in Luke 9, of course, he feeds the 5,000. Much of his teaching occurred around eating, including on the road to Emmaus. Eating together is one of the most important and practical ways of overcoming a burial, a barrier that separates us. It's, it's an incredible way of sharing and fellowship, whether you're bringing uh, one person to your table or many. You can honor God with the gifts he has given you and love people the way that Jesus loved people. It doesn't matter if the meals are fancy, whether they're home cooked, or they're takeout. Whenever contact is made with other people, involves other people, then they connect with one another. The book of Acts also tells us of the new Christians eating together and sharing. During this time, the apostles were teaching along with the fellowship of breaking bread. They not only meet in the temple courts, but also in the homes of believers. And all the time, they were glad with sincere hearts. So it, it's time, at this point, I'll have a little advertisement. After the service today, there's a spaghetti, or spaghetti, and I guess it's not spaghetti, I guess it's rigatoni dinner. And there certainly will be a lot of bread. <laughs> Another 
I guess uh, I'm keeping on the advertisement mode. We have a men's Bible study and prayer breakfast the second Saturday of every month. And John Cox, Ed McFadden, Rob Griner, and at times Mark Barker, whenever his, his uh, schedule permits, they perform a uh, great breakfast for us. Also, Cody has an excellent Bible study that we do during that time. But the point of that whole th gathering together is the fellowship that we have with one another. And that's part of meeting and part of eating together. You get a fellowship and you get conversations going with people. So that, that is important. It's an important part of our Christian relationships with one another. And one of the greatest teaching events, of course, of course uh, occurred with Jesus around the Passover meal, where he set before us this practice that we do today, this breaking the bread, taking the bread as his body, which was broken and given for you, and the juice or the, or the wine at the time, but juice today as his blood poured out for the redemption of our sins. I say it, it is a celebration because it, it seems kind of odd to celebrate an earthly death, but in the same sense, what we have to celebrate is that he gives us by this an opportunity for eternal life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, Lord, as we gather here together as uh, your people in, in, in your home, we ask again that you allow your presence to be felt with each one of us. As we take this bread and we take this cup, that we take this with the sense of awe and the sense of magnitude that, that what you did, it, 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 sometimes it's hard for us to grasp that, but we take things in, in a rote manner where we do this every Sunday, we do this on a regular basis, but yet it is something that we have to look at as, as an awe-inspiring event that we can actually have that connection with you, that we can receive that connection through this, through that, the connection of the bread being your body and the juice being actually the blood. So we can connect with you on a regular basis. We can connect with you and have fellowship with you as we take this bread and this cup. We praise you and thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, I pray this. Amen. The bread his body. And his juice, <clears throat> the juice, the blood poured out for you.
Good morning. If you or someone you know are in need of food assistance, you can call REACH at 304-527-3673. Our Thanksgiving baskets are being prepared. You can see the sign-up sheet or Rob Griner for more information. Now, we have a lot of events coming up, so bear with me here. Um, our spaghetti dinner, as mentioned, is t today, right after church. We have a junior and senior high fall party on October 22nd. Our, mission, our missions trip informational meeting is the next day, October 23rd, after church. Our fall festival will be on October 30th. Trunk or, trunk or treat is on October 31st. Our international conference on missions is November 3rd through 5th. And our Thanksgiving dinner will be November 16th. Now, let's refocus on Jesus, his life, his lessons, and his love for us. Morning, everyone. In case you haven't figured it out, we're having lunch after church, uh, which is not a, a bad thing. Uh, just a couple quick things. Uh, I, I actually forgot to mention this last week, and I should have, um, but I'm like starting to like make notes for myself now so I can remember things. Uh, Hoover's and Heights of Christ, uh, they are partnering with us. They're actually collecting socks uh, just like we are. However, on the other side of that, we are collecting plastic bags for them. And I know every single person in here has a whole bunch of plastic bags somewhere in their house. And if you don't, it's probably because you have cats uh, and you use it for litter. Uh, but if you don't have cats, you probably have tons of plastic bags in your house. Uh, so if you have a bunch of extra plastic bags, drop them off here at the church, or you can actually take them up to Hoover's and Heights. Uh, they give out... Uh, weekend food bags uh, up at Brook Primary North, uh, and they do it every weekend, and so the bags are just to help package the food that they put inside the bags. Uh, so uh, if we can help them out, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, spaghetti lunch after church. Uh, there's a men's community group tomorrow night, actually meeting at Rob's house uh, from 6 to 8. Uh, we haven't quite settled on a name, but I think right now we're calling it brisket and Bible study because <laughs> we're going to smoke meat and we're going to talk about Jesus. Uh, so if you like any of those things, please come on out. If you don't like smoked meat and you still love Jesus, that's fine. Come too. Uh, but just know there's going to be a lot of smoked meat there. Uh, so tomorrow night from 6 to 8, if you need more, in, any more information, see myself or Rob after service. And then just to give you kind of a heads up, next Sunday, uh, I know, <laughs> right? I feel like every Sunday something's different. Uh, that's okay. Uh, but next Sunday, we're actually going to do something a little different when it comes to communion. So part of the, the series that we've been in is this idea of being at the table. And we've talked and we've looked kind of scripturally uh, where food has played a part, uh, not only in God's provision, uh, but how Jesus was known for eating at the table a lot of times with people that were considered sinful or uh, unclean, uh, so much so that uh, that's actually what he was kind of known for, uh, was spending time with undesirable people. Um, and so to kind of wrap everything up next week, we're actually going to be talking about the significance of communion. And so we're actually going to change the way we do communion, actually. Uh, we're going to, instead of doing it mid-service like we have been, we're going to do it at the very end of service. And what we're going to do is we're going to have three tables set up around the sanctuary. Uh, and we're going to have bread that's been cut up. Um, we're going to have little cups of uh, grape juice. And we're going to encourage people at the end of service to gather around the table with your family, with your friends, and to prayerfully consider and take communion together, right? And so it's going to be a little different. Uh, I know some people are still a little leery about um, cleanliness, and we're going to try to do everything we can to make sure that it's as you know, sanitary as possible. But if, if you don't want to take up the bread or the cups, we're still going to have the other ones available. But, but the idea behind this is, it's two, twofold. One, I think a lot of times when we take communion, 
it's really easy to kind of rush through taking of the bread, taking of the juice, and, and not really sitting and thinking about the sacrifice that was made, right? I, I like to think that when Jesus was presenting uh, the Passover meal, when he was talking about a sacrifice, that, that he gave the disciples time to think on and consider what they were going to do. And then the second part of this, and this is the part that I'm excited for, is what a wonderful opportunity to teach your kids why communion is important. I know a lot of times when uh, we take communion, we pass over kids, right? And, and I get it, and, and I know some people uh, are a little leery about letting kids take communion because they haven't accepted Christ. And listen, I, I understand that. But I want to encourage you next Sunday to take communion with your kids. Because I want you to use this as an opportunity to teach them about the significance of the sacrifice of the body broken and of the bloodshed. And, and so when next Sunday comes, whatever your lunch plans are, whatever plans you have after church, I'm going to challenge you to maybe push them back a little bit. And, and when we do this, to really take the time to think on, to pray on, and to focus on why we take communion and why that sacrifice is so important. It's going to be different. That's okay. I'm excited, though, because I think it's really going to help us focus on the necessity and the understanding of what Jesus has done. Let's pray. God, we, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for everything that you have done on our behalf, the, the sacrifice that you have made. God, I pray that as we continue into this series and, and we talk about meeting at the table and talking uh, and gathering together, God, that you allow us to uh, glorify you, allow us to, to be focused on you. And I pray, as always, protect those who hear what I say. God, protect the words that are coming out of my mouth, that they are uh, of you, not of me, that, that the Spirit in us, God, is teaching us and, and, and correcting us and, and using these things to, to, great, uh, to bring us closer and to deeper maturity as your followers. God, we love you. Thank you. Sons and pray. Amen. As I've already said, this idea of food in, in, from a biblical standpoint is not an uncommon thing. Uh, Old Testament, uh, we see multiple occasions where uh, God provides, you know, he sustains his people uh, through the provision of food. Uh, the, the Jewish nation, Israel, was uh, incredibly great at, at having meals together. They, they almost had a meal for everything. Um, there were feasts to remember this and feasts to remember that. Uh, one of the greatest ones that they celebrate and, and they still celebrate was the Passover, right? When, when God freed them from Egypt and, and they were on the run and, and God delivered them from the hands of their enemy. And, and so this idea of feasting together is a very common practice. I, I would argue that in, in the culture that you and I live in today, we have lost the art of feasting together. We do Thanksgiving. We might do Christmas. If you know Bobby Cooper, you go to Bobby's after church on Sunday I'm sure you guys still, I remember when I was here before, you guys always had lunch together after church. But, but we've lost the, the art of, of feasting together. We, we, we find ourselves uh, surrounded or, uh, you know, we're, we're sitting there eating and the whole time we're eating we're... You know, <laughs> I mean, th this is what we do, Right? Listen, I'm not wrong. I love when people take pictures of their food. Uh, I make fun of my wife all the time because uh, she still does it. I'm like, just eat it. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, it looks good. I'm like, you're not wrong. Uh, but this isn't for everyone else. Like, this is for us. But, but we've lost the art of it, right? I, uh, every time I see a movie, uh, probably around the 60s, listen, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not old, but I don't remember the first TV, but I remember the box TVs, uh, the big heavy ones that were just massive. Uh, there's one sitting in my grandparents' basement that we're never going to move. <laughs> We've just accepted that it's part of the household now because uh, it's just too heavy for us and no one wants to mess with it. But, but every time you see like a, an older movie where they kind of look in the 60s, 70s, one of the things that I always find interesting is, is almost without fail, 
people are sitting around watching TV at their little tables, right? They're, they're watching TV. The families together, all their little their table they're, they're sitting at, and they're all watching TV and they're eating their meal together, right? So this this was something that happened, and and it's kind of over the last couple of decades, it's it's become more so. You know, we I have a table in my house, it seats about ten people. It is a wonderful collection place. <laughs> There's so much stuff sitting on our table, but, but I think we just, as a society, we don't eat together. We're, we're so consumed with technology, or when we do come together, it's awkward, or, but, but there's something about eating together that is necessary. John 21, verse 1 through 17, this is after Jesus has uh, resurrected. It says, afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of of Galilee, and it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Now, Now notice here, this is after Jesus has died. He's in the tomb, and the disciples who for the last three years had given up so much of their life, time, energy to, to follow him were lost. So what'd they do? They went back to what they know. So they went back, and they decided, let's go fish. That's what most of us did. That was our livelihood. So they went out fishing, and they caught nothing. It said, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the, disor- uh, stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize but it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. Now keep in mind, these are professional fishermen, right? So this is like me coming to your job when something's not working and trying to tell you how to do your job. I don't know your job. So these professional fishermen are sitting here, they've caught nothing, and this guy on the shore, this stranger they can't even recognize, says, throw your net on the other side. You don't think they thought of that? I can imagine at one point Peter's like, yeah, okay. (laughs) Like, that's going to happen. But they did it. They did it anyways, right? So they, uh, the disciples, sorry, uh, when they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. All night, not a single fish. And then all of a sudden, this man on the shore says, throw it on the other side, and there's so much that they can't even bring it in. Then a disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. They had this realization instantly. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, where he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, so in the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning uh, coals. There were fish on it and some bread. Jesus had made a meal for them. Comes back, shows himself. They catch all these fish. And all of a sudden, they're standing around a fire. And there's a meal prepared for them. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back from the boat, dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even so many, uh, but even with so many, the net was not torn. So Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dare ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and he gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. This was uh, now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they finished eating, Jesus said to Peter, actually, I'm going to stop there. Because, and the reason I'm going to stop there is not because I don't think what about to happen is next important. It is. But I think this video that I have uh, will definitely capture that moment. Grace is God's unmerited favor for us, his crazy love. And the truth is, many times we struggle understanding it. If you find yourself struggling to understand God's grace, don't beat yourself up. 
Even the disciples struggled with understanding grace. Jesus, is that you? You're alive. I can't believe you're alive. Okay, I was in the boat, and I wasn't catching any fish, okay? But I heard this voice, and the voice said, cast your net to the other side. And so I'm thinking, I'm a fisherman. I know what I'm doing, but I'm not catching any fish, you know? And so I throw that net over there, and then a gaggle of fish pop into that net, and I'm going, this is a total miracle. Who could have done that? I need to know who told me to throw the net to the other side. And boom, I look up, and I mean, there is you. You're looking at me on the seashore going, it is I, the Lord, and you're alive. I can't believe you're alive. <laughs> this is awesome. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on. Peter, a, yeah. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. I love you. You're alive. This is so great. Good. And, then feed my sheep. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on, man. It's him. Peter. Yeah. Do you love me? I love you. Yes. And I'm so sorry about that rooster cluck, and I had no idea what that meant, but I do not. I'm better for it. All right. Okay. Then feed my sheep. Andrew, I'm smiling, but I'm serious. Come on, get out of the boat. It's him. Peter. Yeah. Do you love me? Jesus, mere words cannot describe the passion that I have for you. I love you. You know everything. I love you. Good. Good. Then feed my sheep. I didn't even know you had livestock. That is so like you, though. There's something new about you all the time. That's what I love about you. Peter, yeah. do you remember uh, the morning the ladies went to the tomb? Yeah, 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 yeah. We're all in the upper room trying to figure out what to do next, you know, because we thought you were dead. You know, you were dead, you know, and we're trying to figure all that out, you know. And Mary comes running up, and Mary's like saying, beehive, beehive, beehive. And I'm thinking, I'm allergic to bees. Like, keep them out. You know what I'm saying? But as she kept getting closer, I heard her correctly. She was saying, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. And we're going, who's alive, who's alive? And she said, she was at the tomb, and the tomb was empty. And she said that the, there was an angel there. And the angel said, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay, he is risen. And so me and John, we hightailed it down there. And if John says he beat me, he's totally lying, all right? I beat him, FYI, all right, you know? And we get down there, and I'm looking in that tomb, and it is. It is empty. There's nothing in there, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, what does this mean? What does this mean? And John is right there. John is so good with words. He should write a book. He is so good with words. And John said, don't you get it, Peter? This is everything Jesus said he was going to do, and you did it, and it's done. Let's go. This is so great. Wait, yeah. the angel said what? Uh, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay. He is risen. You've risen. Let's go. This he is said what? Go tell the disciples and Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter. You said my name. Why did you say my name? Peter, that's grace. No, no, I don't, I don't deserve that because that night people kept coming up to me asking me if I belonged to you, if I was with you, and I kept denying you left and right, all right? No, it'll take me my whole life to make up for what I did. It was unforgivable for no, what I did. No, What I did on the cross was meant to take what is unforgivable and make it forgivable. That's my grace. It's not about you. It's always about me. That's grace, Peter. You know, whenever... It's always important to pay attention when you read uh, Scripture. I don't think anything is ever uh, misstated. Uh, so for that, the angel to make that remark, you know, to go tell... The disciples, Peter. Peter was a, a man who was claimed and, and wanted to be so much for, for Jesus. And uh, when he was arrested, he was the man that was willing to cut someone's ear off. He, he was the one that swore that he would, he would die before he disowned Jesus. And so when Jesus tells Peter of the that he, you know, before this night's over, you're going to disown me. That I can imagine in Peter's mind, there's this, you know, it's never going to happen. But he does. He denies him three times. He denies knowing him. And, and so, in this encounter, Jesus approaches Peter. I love it because Peter denied knowing Jesus three times. And Jesus restored him three times. Around this meal, this very simple meal on a beach, restoration happened. That's why the, 
the table oftentimes is so important because restoration happens at the table. So many times when, when you and I, when we get together and we eat and, and you kind of break down those barriers, eating together is this incredible way of, of setting aside our differences, our cultures, our common it's commonality, right? We're coming together to feast. And I don't want to say cultures because a lot of times um, the greatest experience I've had is, is when I share meals with people of different cultures. I talked about this when we were in Greece. I didn't agree with all the food <laughs> that was there, but there was something about, uh, I've been in Greece and I was in Guatemala uh, 11, 12 years ago, but there's something about sitting around the table with people and eating good food. And Jesus understood that. So, so Jesus uses this moment to, to restore Peter. And, and, and I can't help but believe that a lot of times Jesus uses us having dinner and meals together to restore people around us. Barry Jones says it like this. He says, I'm convinced that our dinner tables have the potential to be the most missional places in our lives. He says, perhaps before we invite people to Jesus, or even invite them to church, we should invite them to dinner. If table fellowship is a spiritual discipline that is vital for shaping and sustaining our life with God for the world, we need to make a point to share our tables with people who are in our lives but far from God. This was one of the most distinctive aspects of Jesus' ministry. Jesus found himself sitting and eating with people that were incredibly far away from him. I love, I love everything Jesus did because he was probably one of the most intentional people that I've ever studied or have known in my entire life everything he did had a purpose nothing was wasted so he found himself <laughs> eating at the table and and he he used the table to to draw people in conversations happen at the table i, I said it not even that long ago but you know so oftentimes <laughs> When you get together and we eat anymore, this is, this is where we are. Looking at scores, checking our Facebook. I mean, literally, you could be, I've seen people sitting at a table full of people, 10, 15 people, and not a single person is talking. As in, there's not a single piece of food in front of them. Now listen, sometimes you don't talk because the food's good. That's a good thing. But, but as people are waiting for their food, I, they sit around and do anything but engage. Can you imagine if Jesus was like that? Can you imagine that, that as he sat at the table with sinners and tax collectors, if all he did the entire time was talk to the Pharisees? Or imagine if he just sat at the table and he didn't say anything. But, but so often, you and I have, have the opportunity to get together, to eat together, to feast together. And man, we are so not focused on the moment. Jesus wasn't like that. He was intentional. Conversations happen at the table. I, I like what N.T. Wright says. He says, when Jesus himself wanted to explain to his, uh, his disciples what his forthcoming death was all about, he didn't give them a theory. He gave them a meal. J Jesus was, was, was coming to the end of his time on earth. So many things he could say. So many things he could do. Because he knew, he knew that his life was coming to a close. What does he do? He, he sits down with his disciples. He shares a meal with them. He, he takes this kind of one last moment as they, as they gather around the table. 
and they talk <laughs> and they share stories. You can imagine they're they're picking at each other, they're they're goofing off, they're they're remembering all the good times, they're they're talking about crazy things, but but they're gathered around this table and they're they're all eating together. And then Jesus sees a, a divine opportunity to share what's coming next with them. And he passes the bread. He talks about his body being broken. And and I can imagine the disciples are are probably kind of (laughs) confused because they're, that's not going to happen to you. Look at all we're doing. Look, Look at everything we've accomplished. And Jesus is like, no, 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 listen. It's coming. And, and when this happens, I, I need you to remember what it is that I have said. That I am about to go through a very difficult moment. That I am about to, my body is about to suffer. My blood will be shed. And I need you to know that I'm doing it all for you. He took the table. He took a feast. He, he took a very common Jewish feast of, of Passover when, when they remember the sacrifice of the, the lamb and how it covered their doors and how God, uh, as God approached the houses of the Israelites, the, the blood on the door that the spirit of death passed over them and, and instead took out the Egyptians who, who didn't have that. And Jesus says, listen, I, my body, I'm about to sacrifice myself on your behalf and take on the wrath of God and take on the punishment that you deserve. I'm going to do all of that so that if you are in me and if you've accepted who I am, and if you've accepted my sacrifice, when the spirit of death comes to your house, it'll see me and it'll pass over you. And he lays this out in a beautiful way. And he says, every time you break of this bread, you remember that. And every time you drink of this cup, you remember that. That on your behalf, I will give up my life because of that's how much I love you. At the table, the common feast established so much more. That's, that's what the table can do for people. I, I, I love it because the, so often, and I say it, I'll say it again, I'll say it forever, we don't feast together. We don't invite people into our homes like we used to. Or when we do get together, it's so shallow. And we, you're not even really paying attention. And listen, I'm guilty of it. I'm aware of that. Danny and I, uh, we were even talking about this that, Our home is one of the greatest missional fields we have, not only for my family and my children, but for people to come in and to see and to eat and to be together, to sit at a table and to learn their story and who they are. And regardless of what they've done, regardless of who they are, regardless of their politics, regardless of their belief, regardless of all of it, I have an opportunity to invite people into my house to eat and to show them Jesus. We have a chance every time we get together, every time we share a meal, to come together and to model for people that kind of Christ-like love. And it happens sitting around a table. Here's why the table matters. Luke 14, 15 through 24. Jesus is talking about uh, a wedding feast. As one of those at the table heard, uh, heard him, sorry, with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And Jesus replied, uh, and so he tells a parable. He says, a certain man was preparing a, uh, a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent the servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike begin to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field. I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen. And I'm on my way to try them out. Can't make it. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. So the servant comes back to the master 
And he reports this to him. And the owner of the house became angry. And he ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. So Jesus, in, in this context, is, is speaking heavily against the Pharisees that, that, have made, that have made it almost impossible for people to come to God because he, he has shown up, he's arrived, he's in person, he's doing his ministry, and they're still rejecting him. And, and so in this story, he says, listen, if the religious elite don't want me, I'll take anyone. I'll take anyone who's willing to come to my table. Go find the lame, the crippled, uh, the broken, and the beggars. And when that's done, still there's, there's room at my table. Go find the rest. But, but those that, that have denied me, those who are who choosing not to come because they don't think they need me, they will not taste of my banquet. This is not. I, I made an appeal to them. I, 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 I asked them. I invited them. And and yet, they denied me. So, so humility is found at the table. When, when we come to the table, we come with a realization that the invitation really is for everyone. The lame, the broken, the crippled, the beggar. That, that, that Jesus was, was making it clear that, that the message that he was bringing was was for anyone who was willing to come and to listen. It should humble us. I, I talked about it last week, but I love the story of David and, and what David did as a king for Mephibosheth. Because Mephibosheth was a man who was lame in both feet that had nothing to offer King David. And yet when he invited when David invited him to the table, he allowed him to sit at the table like one of his sons. The king took this man who, who could not take care of himself, who, who could not in, in any way bring anything to the table of value and said, listen, come sit at my table. Come, scoot up, be a part of, of my family. And, and the correlation between what David did and what we see Jesus doing in the New Testament is, is Jesus is literally inviting people to sit at his table that don't deserve to be there. <laughs> and, and, and that should, it, and if it doesn't, I don't, know, I don't know what to say, but if that doesn't make you step back and realize, whew, that's incredible. That, that the table, uh, the banquet that the king has set, I've been invited to be a part of. That's, that's how much Jesus loved me, that, that in my brokenness, he invited me to sit at his table. It dawned on me, and, and I think I was talking to someone earlier about this, I, I love it because a lot of times when, when I spend time studying and preparing, it's amazing what God continues to show me. I, and I, I, my whole life, I look forward to the day that I, I die and I meet him. But until that happens, man, I, I look forward to what God is going to show me for the rest of my life. I, I think that that's something we should strive for. And, and so I was sitting uh, earlier this week, and I was sitting around our table. We have a, a pretty decent-sized table in our house. It probably sits about 10 people. And uh, one of the things that I always find funny is when the table is clear, because we do use it, it's not just for storage, but when the table is clear, there's 10 chairs that sit around our table. And normally I sit on one end or the other if we're working on something. And <clears throat> we were working on uh, pumpkins and a few other things with the boys. And so there's my chair, and then there's two chairs right here, and then there's all these chairs right here. And Everett and Griffin are always fighting for that one chair, <laughs> like sitting right next to me. They, like, they push each other out of the way. They get mad. And like, they'll get upset because they can't, like, if, if Griffin can't sit at that chair, he doesn't want any of the other seven. Forget it. <laughs> it. It doesn't matter that they're all equal. 
It doesn't matter if they all look the same. He doesn't want it. He wants that chair. And Everett doesn't want to give it up. Everett's bigger than him, and he knows that. But, but it's interesting because I see them bicker. And I'm like, just stop it. <laughs> I'm like, just sit down. Like this table, I, I can reach everywhere. Like, I'm not little. <laughs> I, I can reach to the end of it. And, and so there's this weird thing that happens, right? And, and, and I think it, it's interesting because a lot of times I, I think that's where you and I are is we feel like we have to fight for our spot at the table, at the table that Jesus has set, and that's not realistic. That table is huge. It is massive. There is always going to be room at the table for one more. And one more, and one more, and one more, and one more. Because it's, that is who Jesus is. There will always be room at his table for you. And, and here's the other thing that I realized. You don't need my approval to sit there. It's not my table. I, I you and I, we do not get to pick who sits at the table with Jesus. You and I are participants who sit at the table with Jesus. It's not my table. I can't make anyone leave. I can't make anyone switch spots. I can't tell people whether or not they can come or go. I I can't even kick anyone out. It's not my job. It is not my job nor my place in the kingdom of God to determine who enters in and who doesn't. I have no say over that. And thank God for that. I wouldn't want that kind of weight. But here's the thing. What we do have the ability to do, what you and I can do and should do, is we should grab that chair next to us that's empty and pull it out and say, hey, by the way, you want to have a seat? You want to sit with me? You want to talk? want to pray together? You want to come to my house and eat? You want to go get something to eat, some coffee? There's a table. There's a table. There's a chair here ready at the table that my father, by the way, his, my, my gracious, loving, incredible father in heaven has made for you. You want to sit down? You look tired, by the way. Life looks like it's kind of beating you up right now a little bit. You look weary. You want to sit down? You, you want to you kick up your feet? You, you want to have a meal together? Do you want to you experience the grace and the goodness of God? Because let me tell you, it's amazing. So come join me at the table of the king. That's who we should be. Because they're until this world comes to an end. There's always going to be room for one more. Jesus said it best. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30. It says, come to me. All of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. There's always room for one more. Thank God. (laughs) Thank God he's got a table that's big enough for the one more. Because I was the one more. You were the one more. The, the neighbor. <laughs> the neighbor that you might not be friends with. They're one more. That family member that, that you struggle with. They're one more. The, the person at school that you don't get along with. They're one more. There is room at the table for them too. Let's pray. God, we, 
We thank you for who you are. We thank you so much for the way that, that you love us. And I, I pray that, that we, oh, I, I ask God that you, the spirit that is in us, challenges us at, at the deepest level of who we are to, to open the door and to understand the need to bring people to your table regardless of whether or not we like them or whether or not we think they deserve it. But because we don't, we don't deserve to sit with you, but you've invited us to. Let us see beyond our selfishness and our pride and our arrogance to see people the way that you do. Because God, if there is room at your table for them, there should be room at our table too. We love you and we thank you. And then we pray. Amen. You know, I, uh, I want to invite you this morning to come, come sit at the table. Not, not just afterwards and having lunch. I think that's amazing. I'm excited. But, but to actually come and, and to sit and experience the goodness of God. And, and if you've never made that decision, or, or maybe you just need prayer, we talk about it, but at the end, you are... Our leadership will be around the room. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to talk to you. But, but if you're ready to make that decision and say, listen, I, I'm ready to, <laughs> to sit at that table, let me invite you to it. Let me be the first to pull up a chair and say, have a seat. Because I promise you, the moment you sit at that table, not only will it change your life, but you're never going to. Christ will meet you there, come while he waits for you, listen to his voice, leave with him your care, and begin life brand new, kneel at the cross, leave every care kneel at the cross Jesus will meet you there kneel at the cross give your idols up look unto realms of Yes, my. Turn not away to life's sparkling cup. Trust only in His love. Kneel at the cross. Leave every care. Leave Jesus will meet you there. Kneel at the cross. Leave every care. Kneel at the cross. Jesus will meet you there. Y'all have a great week and be blessed. And join us for lunch.